help me with the PowerPoint. Um, thank you so much, Jack. And I'm just so, I have to say, personally, I'm so pleased to be here to discuss this topic. Um, for me, it's one of these things where you wait all your life for a particular invitation, or so it seems. There's so many things with Motherwell that resonate with my particular interests and my painting and writing and scholarship. But just, uh, I think that I'll provide a little bit of a personal anecdotal introduction and, and I think that that will be a good way to introduce also David and Carrie because all of us have experienced, you know, this kind of firsthand resonance. I also want to thank uh, Morgan Spangle, who I don't think is here today, who extended me the invitation to come, and um, Katie Rogers, of course. I have been luxuriating, I have to say, in um, this Motherwell Catalog Raisonné book. It is a fabulous, not just object, but piece of scholarship. Uh, the essays are really spot on, but just the, the kind of literal presentation of everything in it is so beautifully handled. And it's just a magnificent book, and the fact that we have that now. So I've been, you know, reading that this past week, uh, the Motherwell Collected Writings book, um, and um, it's just been a tremendous experience. So I start with this image here. Probably a lot of you have seen it. It's such a funny print. It was mass produced by the Wadsworth Athenaeum as part of a uh, 10 artist uh, print portfolio. And uh, it is an edition, but it's a sort of mass edition. And it incorporates a torn paper element. Uh, and when I was a young child, uh, my parents had this print, and I looked at it and looked at it with fascination. It dates from 1964, um, but I think that this was really my first prolonged interaction with an abstract art image. And as a child, of course, abstraction and childlike ways of seeing are related. Uh, I would look at it and wonder if it was a, a, a cave, possibly. Um, you know, these two uh, entrances here. Uh, it could be read as a face, either this as kind of an eye with teeth, or this could be the jaw of a monster. This could be kind of the nose of something, you see that? And it, it also has this kind of India ink articulation on it, a drawing uh, on top of a collage. And of course, growing up in New York City in the 1960s, going to art classes at MoMA and all this kind of thing, Little Dalton, uh, that was the language of the art we were being taught as well. Um, Motherwell really was, to me, what modern art looked like. Um, and I think often um, there is this image-specific tension that I saw at age five uh, still when I look at Motherwell. Uh, and this sensation has stayed with me since childhood. Uh, is really one of the central mysteries of abstract painting. I'm going to show you some examples of my own work. I, I really like this idea that you know the artists are going to talk about how their art relates. I'm very much looking forward to hearing it from David Reed and Carrie Moyer. Um, you know, when I started to oh, this let me just say, is there any more fabulous? phrase uh, than this, uh, psychic automatism. I mean, if I could say that's what I'm engaged in. And in Jack Flam's introductory essay in the Catalogue Resonne, he immediately seizes upon this term as central to Motherwell's practice. And it's certainly central to my practice. Uh, I still believe very strongly in uh, the interaction between the unconscious and the conscious, um, that uh, there's this marvelous uh, undercurrent of uh, psychic imagery that's available and accessible through process-specific methodology. Um, when I was 
taking, ex first I looked for some examples of my paintings that I thought maybe had something to do with Motherwell. And as soon as I did that, in almost every painting of mine that I looked at, I said, well, there's something to do with Motherwell. I see that DNA everywhere. I think in 21st century painting, a lot of what we're dealing with is a kind of pre-associational quality where it's not just the person making the painting, but the viewer already has such a sophisticated lexic, graphic, visual inventory, mental slide library, that when they see something, they see resonating in that these images of what they already know. So as a painter working today, you have that as an advantage, or at least as a shift in terms of how people look. But here's an example of something, not just in terms of the palette, but in terms of sort of attitude, organization, uh, the application of Mark. Uh, I like very much in Motherwell uh, how he reduces color schemes, um, how um, each mark becomes a kind of iconographic signifier. And as I said before, uh, you know, what I'm doing in this painting over here is kind of making a constructed brushstroke that is a kind of physicalized manifest uh, depiction of a brushstroke. You know, uh, I've thought about this open series. I'm going to read a few more notes after I show you these examples of paintings. I often say to my students, listen, when you choose a compare and contrast, if the two images are resonating with each other, you don't really have to say that much about it. Um, I am very much taken with this idea of using that upper stretcher bar as a kind of literalized uh, place from which a sheet of paint can hang. Um, now that's not quite the same as putting one painting in front of another and tracing it, but it plays with what some of the previous panelists talk about in terms of uh, the picture plane, the picture frame. Um, in modernist work, you know, how is this readdressed? Also very much, even though my application of paint is literal, you know, I'm playing this literalist material sweep of paint against brushwork that reads illusionistic space. Anytime you have chiaroscuro, light and dark, you have illusionistic space constantly in Motherwell, you have that interplay as well. You know, on the left is a painting I painted about a month ago, not thinking in any way uh, I was working with Motherwell's elegies as a template. Rather, uh, the way I organize Mark uh, into a kind of coalesced armature-like image is very much informed by how my eye has received Motherwell. And note, again, this kind of illusionistic space in the background uh, because the oil is applied as a semi-transparent wash. Well, you have that same effect here with the Motherwell, and then there's a flattening in the foreground because of the uninflected black paint. And I very much like that idea that you have kind of a, a sheet of paint in the foreground that is always telling you that a painting is, in fact, a flat pictorial plane, but that there is you know, perceived retinal room between those two uh, distinct elements. You know, I talked about a pre-associational image that viewers bring to something, but I also think that we're dealing with after image. Uh, in uh, the paintings of um, a colleague of mine, John Zurier, we have oddly familiar names, uh, he makes these kind of washed out versions of geometric post-war abstraction. And I started to think, well, maybe his paintings are like the after images from a art historical slide presentation in a darkened room, you know? And I like that as well, that, you know, 
in an age when innovation and the avant-garde are no longer the primary mechanism through which abstract painting is made, you know, what are, in fact, the mechanisms? And I think that afterimage is one particular way to think about it and the depiction of that afterimage. Again, a painting I made without thinking that it was Motherwellian until I encountered it this past week putting together the PowerPoint. I've been making these paintings where I make a kind of automatist, flattened, pressed shape, and I use a tool that has an edge on it so that I can uh, inscribe a kind of grid-like geometry over what is otherwise a kind of gestural, undulating, curving process achieved monoprint, basically. What you have is gesture moving against structure. That's something I very much appreciate in these Motherwell paintings, where you have these vertical divisions constantly compressing bodies of paint, um, e the silhouetting that takes place, the compartmentalizing. What happens is that each event that takes place in one of these panels becomes a figure of sorts. I think culturally we tend to read things left to right, panel-like. Another great quote that we encountered this morning was about you know, painting as a kind of advanced language that's beyond language, even though it can be informed by poetics and philosophy. Um, I love the idea of automatist exploration, and that is what I am celebrating in works such as this one on the left in Oblivion. Um, and I like this sense of light emanating from behind a mass of paint achieved through transparency and uh, brushwork. You know, I called this painting on the left Mind Palace, and I do think that there is a kind of uh, cerebral nature to this uh, automatist pursuit. Uh, but you are also depicting something finite that relates to synaptic structures and other uh, things that we think about in 20th and 21st century life. Um, finally, this past year at Graham Gallery, I did an exhibition with the somewhat arch title, re uh, and in that I uh, gave some thought to uh, how much time I had spent thinking about this particular group of New York School artists, and I was looking at some of their earlier paintings, Gottlieb, Motherwell, Stamos, uh, where the pictographic is so much more pronounced. These are, of course, the paintings that are the bridge between European surrealism and post-war American large-scale abstraction. Um, in these kind of Jungian archetype symbology iconographies, uh, you have something that is neither an image of something nor fully materially abstract. And so, for example, here I am reiterating these suns and asterisks and odd uh, thickets of brushstroke that moved painting from a kind of pictographic drawing activity to a uh, field encounter. Okay, with that I'd like to give a few more personal biographical notes and then I will hand over the lectern to my esteemed colleagues. Uh, my academic introduction to abstract expressionism came in my junior year at Yale undergraduate when I took a seminar devoted to the topic taught by Professor Ann Gibson. Any of you familiar with her scholarship? <laughs> and it was her first year teaching. Sometimes when you get somebody in their first year teaching, it can be very special. And I barely knew, I mean, I knew these paintings, but I didn't know what abstract expressionism necessarily was. You know, uh, one of the things that excited me was the quality of seeing these paintings projected as black and white slides. Here we had this incredible Yale Art Gallery directly across the street, but um, something about the intimate seminar classroom and looking at these slides on a slide projector 
uh, excited me, their photo documentation. So I, I really think that that's something very specific to my generation as well. We are often painting the photographic reproduction of a painting as opposed to painting the painting itself. We've spent so much time looking at art magazines and now Google images and et cetera, that it's about a kind of receivership of images of sorts. It was also the literary connection that really got me. I was under the spell of stream of consciousness modernist authors, Joyce, Beckett, Celine, Kerouac. I recognized in New York School painting a kindred spirit of untrammeled, unconscious thought put into literal form. I was particularly taken with how Motherwell had used one small India ink study as the format for his lifelong elegy series. We looked at this earlier which again, I had seen as a child in the 1960s. To me, this is what modern art looked like. For the term paper in the class, I got it into my head to write a comparative paper about Albert Camus and Motherwell. <laughs> I imagined that Motherwell, the Francophile, would have been affected by the existentialist mood of Camus and that there was a comparative narrative experience in his art. And I said, I wrote about this to Jack Flam, I said, I was a somewhat naive student. <laughs> now, of course, I seriously regret that I did not just call up Motherwell and visit him in Greenwich, Connecticut at the time to do some primary research on this, you know, I, and this is something that I'm constantly now urging my students at New School who are in New York City to do. You know, you can look somebody up in the phone book. This was my experience later when I started Journal of Contemporary Art and we called people like David Reed on the phone and asked them if they'd be interviewed. Entering the New York art scene after college, 1983, I encountered a slightly older group of painters. <laughs> Through my stewardship of editing of Journal of Contemporary Art, a magazine consisting of interviews with artists, I learned that the general rap on Motherwell was that he was uncool. Sorry, I hate to say that. He was the privileged banker's son, the affected outsider, more a writer than a painter. But, big but. <laughs> But around 1987, with a younger group of artists coalescing, this received opinion met with revisionism. My friends Carl Ostendarp and Richard Phillips had just arrived in New York fresh from receiving their Yale MFAs. We all decided that Motherwell's open series was the coolest. Something about its detachment, its feigned casualness, anticipated a lot of what was to come. Also, that no one cared about these paintings made them more appealing. Of course, the reverse chic, the Motherwell Open series is cool. Now everyone thinks this way. Uh, at a Parsons Gimbal Library deaccessioning book sale, this is my favorite thing they do, the Gimbal Library puts out a table of books and you get to, as faculty, you get first crack to pour over them. I purchased for $1 the catalog for Reconciliation Elegy, which is the big painting that's here in Washington at the East Wing National Gallery. And it's a late elegy painting done in grand scale. And this uh, Skira book documents its making. This publication was curious indeed, seeing how Motherwell essentially appropriated an image of his own work, recreating it as a public monument. And I think there's something very kind of contemporary now when you see that process. Uh, point number five, the Motherwell Early Collages Show, 2013, recently at the Guggenheim. Um, that was certainly a game changer for anybody who saw it. Um, for me, just really remarkable in terms of the early date of the works when thinking about the chronological trajectory of abstract expressionism and for the methodologies employed, their radicality, their facility, and for this finite bridge between Matisse and Picasso in American post-war painting. You know, those elements really hit home in that show, and it was a tour de force. Uh, finally, 
uh, some thesis points that have emerged over the years thinking about New York School. It was, of course, Motherwell who taught Pollock the verbal language that he would subsequently use in interviews to describe his work to the public. This is fairly well documented. It's so important in terms of how the public perceived abstract expressionism. Pollock was the figure, and it was really Motherwell who provided the vocabulary for Pollock to describe his work, and also to bring these terms that had to do with the unconscious, psychology, surrealism, to the fore for a general audience uh, of an American public. Finally, back to the idea of the imagist approach. Certainly Motherwell is associated with images, French poetry, et cetera, but also that's part of what keeps Motherwell's work looking contemporary. It weighs process against specific iconography. Think of Rashid Johnson's current work at the Drawing Center, his Anxious Men show. It's just one of many, many examples of a contemporary artist working in this imagist, automatist territory. I also think this strongly ties Motherwell to Zinzer, Reed, Moyer, working now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>